Hello, ranchers. This is another Ranch Life direct message. It's not going to be as long format. I'm going to talk to you about a book I just read. Um, we're kind of in a transition phase here. Blaze is real busy and everything. I'm real fuck. Oh, God damn it. I'm sorry. I'm really pumped. Blaze uh, is trying to make some moves, man. He drove out to Chicago to, I guess, to try out this restaurant he tried out once before. He might be hucking it, man. He's wrenching, baby. It gets me so pumped. When people start getting... When people start wrenching... Oh, my God. It makes me so pumped up. That's beautiful. It's like poetry. It, it really is. Like, when anyone gets juiced on life, it's just... It's just beautiful. It is exactly like poetry. Um, yeah, wow. So, we're kind of in limbo here. So, today I'm, I'm not going to do a full-long analysis on, on on a book or anything i just this, this, i just read this book and it really just was i think it was phenomenal i mean like it, i would add it to the core of like we talked about this one the omnivore's dilemma if you can't see i just held it up that's like a great book to lay the foundation for food and how to how to shift your perception of food like Maybe some of the info isn't quite exactly where it needs to be, but to shift your perception to of how you eat, that book is great to give you an understanding of it. it. Really builds up your resolution of the food industry and how food gets to your plate. This book, I think, would is would be similar, um, a similar type idea to the book to um, so, oh, man, wow, a similar idea but with more like your psyche. The book is by Jonathan Haidt. Uh, it's called the happiness hypothesis. Now, Jonathan Haidt is a professor at NYU. I should just look it up. I got the computer in front of me. I should have did this beforehand. H i d t h h i d t h. I think H a i d t. Jonathan Haidt. He's a uh, American social psychologist and professor of ethical leadership at New York. University Stern School of Business. He studies uh, morality, psychology of morality, like human de decision making and how morality plays into it. Um, he's written several books. I read his book that was released last year called uh, The Coddling of the American Mind. Which kind of lays us uh, the groundwork of how we kind of got to the way our culture is right now, which some would call like the polarizing term would be like victimology culture, but it kind of points out where our society turned that allowed um, some millennials and I Gen or Gen, they call it Gen Z, whatever, to be more entitled and to be more coddled. And the book does a really, really good job of laying that out without feeling like it's wagging the finger or patronizing you. The happiness hypothesis, uh, I wish I read that first. And I'm sure when I read his first book, The Righteous Mind, uh, I might think the same thing. I probably should have re re read them all in order. But I didn't because I always think I know what's better for me and then I learn that I'm wrong. And part of books like The Omnivore's Dilemma and the happiness hypothesis very much have to do with admitting you're wrong. Or be, or at least being open to the idea. So, the happy hypoth happiness hypothesis is just, it's just wonderful. Um, it's based on positive psychology, which I've never, I've never heard of beforehand. But why would I? I'm not a psychologist. And he has this great point in, where he says, in, you know, in, in the last century... Psychology really focused on on negative emotion. There's like there's a whole freaking encyclopedia of diagnoses and all this study on fear and hate and disgust and anger and all of this. When there's no yang to that yin, which is a great analogy because the happiness hypothesis really focuses on an ancient wisdoms and where they were pretty much nailed it in a lot of the cases. And he uses a lot of the framework of um, Freudian psychology a little bit, 
with the ego, the super ego, and the id. He uses a different analogy to the elephant and the rider, which you could also say like the horse and the rider. And um, these themes go out throughout the book in a way that really, really helps you understand what he's talking about. And it builds up. In just It's just so well written. It's built up in a way that when it gets to the heavy stuff at the end, the previous chapters build up on it. It's really quite wonderful. The, the um, I'll just give you the list of the ch chapters to get an idea. Um, the introduction is uh, too much wisdom, and that kind of goes into the idea that we kind of like went too hard with knowledge and wisdom and thinking about facts and studies, and we kind of forgot like the intrinsic nature of of the self and the world. Right? Uh, chapter two is the divided self about how we kind of don't even know what we want. Chapter, well, I'm sorry, it was chapter, intro, so then chapter one was divided itself, chapter two is changing your mind, kind of understanding the things, uh, chapter three is uh, reciprocity and vengeance, he talks very much about how the idea of reciprocity is how we evolved, you do this for me, I do it for you, and that's like a really governing thing that, you know, most animals don't have, and it might even really be specifically to us. And he makes some, like, wonderful analogies to um, plants that are, not plants, animals that are super organisms, like, like bees and ants, where they're actually, they actually, they live as their one super organism. And a lot of based on reciprocity, kind of. There's, there is, it's a complex book. I'm doing a bad job. But the opposite of reciprocity is vengeance. And, you know, when you're focusing more on vengeance than reciprocity, uh, you go into dark places. Um, chapter four, the faults of others. I don't remember what that chapter was about, <laughs> honestly. Uh, chapter five, the pursuit of happiness. That kind of, that chapter kind of went into, um, what we pursue in happiness, um, it was very reminiscent of, uh, what chapter, what was it? In Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, he has one chapter, uh, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. And if you're one of those people that thinks Jordan Peterson's like a fuck friggin' uh, alt-right, you're, you need to just take a deep breath and you should really listen to what the guy is saying because he's very smart. And, but there's a, his book, I would recommend the happiness hypothesis much over um, Peterson's self-help book, 12 Rules for Life. But I'm not going to get into that exactly right now because they kind of take different, same messages, just different way, different delivery. Um, chapter 6, Love and Attachments. That chapter is uh, amazing. He breaks down love in a clinical way. That was just like mind blowing. The similarities between romantic love and familial love, and lasting love versus like you know the um, the puppy love you have when you meet someone new, and and just a lot of studies based on that stuff was pretty pretty amazing. Um, he taught uh, chapter seven the uses of adversity. Uh, a lot of what's in the coddling of the American mind is based on that chapter. Similar ideas that we are. We are anti-fragile, meaning what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, right? Um, the whole idea of like, you know, coddling children is you think that things that what that they're going to hurt them and not kill them is going to actually make them weaker. And that's not true. The human psyche, the immune, the immune system and people generally, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. So in that chapter, it really touches about how we have to face adversity to become stronger he talks about studies where people go through terrible life events and how they come out greater for it. He touches on uh, some kind of like faux pas things that he talks about in The Calling of the American Mind too, where um, like most people that are sexually assaulted actually are fine or grow to be fine. That statistically, most people are like, oh, okay, we can get to this, you know. And the people that can't, like, I'm not trying to, um, 
demean the people that have issues with that. Like you need, everyone needs to work through their stuff, and we all have a different battle. We're all we're all always at battle, and everyone's got a different battle. But it is the adversity, and I could speak personally. Like when I think about my life before my father died, who's right up there. Shout out, Dad. Uh, I was a child. I was a kid. I was just at the time. I just felt like lost when I lost my father and kind of like just went for some big moves that I probably wouldn't have never done otherwise. And he talks about that phenomenon when, when something absolutely devastating and traumatic, uh, traumatic, I don't know if traumatic is the word, that's more physical. When something really devastating happens, you actually get into this state where you're way, it kind of clears the playing field, it clears the slate and you can make big life changes because you're like, whoa, it kind of shakes the foundation and you can, you know, maybe you're only moving horizontally and all of a sudden something terrible happens and you're like, well, now I'm free to move any direction. You can go laterally or whatever. Um, I don't think I would have ever tried to make a move like uh, this, this podcast or the skate park or putting every penny I own into the, this crazy gamble had I been still in that state where like, you know, the foundation of my being wasn't rocked like that, you know. That chapter was just really, really great. And they and the, the studies, they talk about people that have been through things and how they life, their lives turn around is pretty, pretty awesome stuff. Very uplifting. Um, and he goes into virtue, chapter 8, the felicity of virtue. He talks about virtue. Um, you want to historically... Um, in the past, they say you want to live a virtuous life. Let me Google virtue here. Behavior showing high moral standards. See, we, we have um, we have morphed virtue in our society. Okay. Now we we think vir- we talk about we'll talk about people. Um, a lot of millennials and younger get caught up into this virtue signaling thing. It's kind of like peacocking, but virtue signaling is like, like you get all these people that are just so outwardly speaking for perceived oppressed other people. Um, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. Like I completely advocate for everyone getting up and doing their thing and, you know, just kicking butt all the time. But, like when you get, like some people are just so overly outspoken about like these kind of like social justicey things, it's so over the top and it seems so like, like what are you doing? Well, what they're doing is virtue signaling. Is like they're like, well, right now, I don't want to make this sound like I'm talking crap on people, right? But like, essentially, those people are saying right now, our society says you're a good person if you do this and advocate for that. So then some people just go ham on it, man. Bumper stickers on the car, the t-shirts, the Facebook posts, and they're essentially saying, hey, everyone look at me, everyone look at me, look at me, I'm virtue signaling, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. That's different than historically virtuous things. Virtue is like, you know, in, in a more ancient sense, ancient, I guess ancient sense. Virtue is like, Cultivating your ability to handle adversity. Virtue is, you know, becoming one with nature. Virtue is being emotionally sound. Like, just it, generally, a lot of what religions do is they're, they're trying to promote you to transcend yourself in a uh, step for something higher, which is actually the next chapter in that book which is a uh, divinity with or without God. So virtue is kind of like what, like most religious stories is like, don't be a dick. Everyone's like, no, oh, there wasn't a flood. It's like not everything in religion, not everyone that's religious is a fundamentalist. Not everything is literal. In fact, it's not literal at all. It's like, be prepared, right? Isn't that's essentially like, the moral of, like, just to stick with, like, the Noah's Ark thing. It's like, 
be prepared because the storm's coming, right? And the other side of it is like, if you're not prepared and you're looking the other way and you're being, you're living a, a decadent life, which is not virtuous, you know, you're going to get washed away when the flood comes. Pretty simple, like, and to bring it back to what we said earlier about how traumatic life events often let people rise up and make big moves, like, you kind of got to get blindsided sometimes, but you're better off being prepared. But no matter how prepared you are, you might get blindsided. So it's like this give and take. It's always going to be there. Be prepared for the storm. The section, uh, chapter 9, Divinity with or Without God, was great. Because he opens up with this thing that I very, 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 very much related to. He says that in his 20s, he would have never been able to write this chapter. And I was like, yep, I get it. I've been on the same journey myself. I do not believe in a literal God. I actually don't even really believe in, in any sort of actual higher being. But I do believe in trying to constantly wrench your life and, and transcend into something greater and bigger. Um, and when he, when he opens the chapter saying like, this is, you know, I would have never been able to write this. I thought it was all stupid and fairy tale and dumb. And, and I thought the same way too. And you, you, you throw away the baby with the bathwater. Throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's a great analogy, great expression. And he talks about how very secular people, mostly on the political left, a lot of these kind of like people would define in that category, like that social justice -y kind of thing. They actually... They are religious. They don't. They think they're like anti-religious, but they've tr they have adopted a different value system of transcendence, and they and they latch onto it in a way that's so like, mm, like that's it. That's why when, you know, no matter how, you know, progressive a company can be, eventually if they don't go far enough, they're like, all right, well then you're just insert X. That company is, you know racist now because they've they've latched on to this um it's kind of like i guess it would presume it would be something like the the ball the ball of social justice that started rightfully so in the civil rights movement in the in the 60s and it kind of kept going and going and the, the momentum kept going and it's like we're just going to keep fighting and they and it became too fundamentalist where it's just stuck on identity politics so it's, and 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 um what's the term intersectionality I digress. That I think the chapter is just great. He talks about how people of faith report they are happier than people that are not of faith. He compares different faiths and, and, and just the idea when he says God, or without, it's about transcendence in general. And then chapter 10 is happiness comes from between. And this is where the stuff really starts to pull together about love and transcendence and not being focusing on others and pursuing the right type of happiness and having being having more reciprocity in your life than vengeance. It all comes together. When he says happiness comes from between, I mean this this book with these last like three chapters of the book, man, I was like just oh my, I'm gonna read it again or I listen to it. I'm gonna listen to it again. He says that happiness is not coming from only internally and it is not coming from only externally he talks about when people say what's the meaning of life he basically says there's two questions what's the meaning of life what's the purpose of life like why am i here what am i supposed to do while i'm here and those questions come from in between outside and inside and it's a complicated analogy and the way the book leads up once he gets to it it, all the pieces fall together and it makes a lot of sense more so than what I'm saying it right now and you should read this book and then it closes with uh, balance and that's just kind of you know balancing all these things um, it's pretty great I mean like the section that when they open up with the divided self when they go between you know, your mind and your body and your left brain and your right brain and like your, he makes this great analogy of old brain, new brain, where it's like you're evolved. Um, it's, there's like 
the deeper part of your brain, which is evolved from other animals, and then the frontal cortex of your brain, which is basically particular to higher primates, which is great because it that echoes really much with a lot of um, the Freudian psychology where there's those basic like primal things that you can't just get away from. So I thought that was just just absolutely wonderful. Uh, again, the book is called The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. It's wonderful. I wish he narrated, narrated it himself. I listened to it on Audible. His other book, I listened to, he narrated it himself, and he's a very, very soothing voice. Even uh, in two and a half speed, his voice is very soothing, because <laughs> I read books that fast because I'm a maniac. And uh, I think it's worth noting, um, I can't read. I can read. I struggle to read. I struggle to pay attention when I read. It is a difficult, it is a, a battle. But I could listen to a book. And I've actually found that as I ramp up the speeds on the book, it actually holds my attention even better. Like, the faster it is, the more I know I need to pay attention, so I stay paying attention better. If you don't read, start reading. And by reading, I also mean listening or reading. Like, you can't do work that's too engorging when you're listening because it's kind of a dense book but man get an audible account i mean all the dumbass shit you spend your money on like if you if you buy a book a month like you're investing in yourself it is i mean i can't think of too many things all right hold on let me let me step back and let you know i didn't actually i don't think i could read till third grade and I never, I didn't read a single book in high school. I read one, a Kurt Cobain, a biography, because I was like all into Kurt Cobain. Um, I did none of the readings in high school. I never did summer reading. I literally never read until The Omnivore's Dilemma. So this is coming from someone that didn't even read until, say, 27, 28. I was just like, everyone else, just like, just, I don't want to swear, but I was just like fucking off and just doing this and drinking and and just thinking I was doing okay and thinking I was eating okay and thinking I was like, oh, I'm really active because I ride. And, and there are very few things that I derive as much pride from now than when I finish reading a book. Like, I love lectures and podcasts. Those are good too. You learn facts. But I mean, but when like... When you put that book in, like, you, I have this stack of books here on my left. Like, like, I read all that. I learned all that. Like, no one can take that away from you, man. It's great. I highly, highly recommend you read this book, <sighs> The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt, uh, Finding Modern Truth in Ancient Wisdom. I really think it will make your life better. I really think... There's just so much perspective. Like, there was a couple times in the book where, like, there was a couple lines that were just so, like, wham, wham, wham. Like, I paused it. Like, I'm riding. I ride my bike, and I'm like, holy crap. And I take my phone out, and I pause it. And then for the next, like, 15 minutes, I would just think about that. Holy crap. Like, I never thought about that. This, I'll tell you one of the more fascinating things in the book that... It doesn't really make. It doesn't really add to the narrative of being happy, but this is like something I, like, I never realized that, and never thought that. And a lot of people wouldn't think that, but it was just very fascinating that romantic love very, very much mimics the love between a newborn and the mother, and it feels like a faux pas because, like, parent-child love is in the eyes of society, the farthest thing apart from, like, romantic sexual love, right? And, like, it even feels wrong talking about it, but they've studied this. And, like, the eye contact, the cuddling, the touching, the stimu the mouth stimulation, like, kissing, sucking, you know, um, there's, you know, obviously there's, breastfeeding involved. I don't know if any of you have been involved in romantic love. There's, you know, oftentimes there's touching with breasts or nipples and mouths and, and there's like this stimulation like in um, 
it wasn't actually Freud, I don't think. I think in Nietzsche's, one of the psychologists' development talked about how you go through this phase of, like, being obsessed with uh, physically touching and then, like, um, mouth stuff and then, like, butt stuff and something about the development of, like, wiping a baby's butt. I don't know. That's a little off tangent, but I was just blown away that there was all, although the context is is different, what is being stimulated between the mother and the child building that love is very much like when you first meet someone and you and you have that puppy love phase and you're touching and you're cuddling and, and all those things. And I was just like, holy crap. Hmm. But I definitely um, recommend reading this book, Jonathan Haidt, Happiness Hypothesis. If you read it, let me know. I'll give you a high five. I would love to, anyone local, if you read the book, I would absolutely love to sit down and talk to you about the book. I would love to reread any singular chapter and have a discussion about the singular chapter and how it relates to my life or your life, and we can kind of discuss it. I think this is one of the, book, the books everyone should read. It's just fantastic. And with that, I am uh, I'm going to sign off today. It's kind of a long talk about a book that you probably aren't going to listen to this. <laughs> There's really no reason to. You could just pause this after 30 seconds and just download the book and read it. Just read the book. It's a great book. And if you have trouble reading and trouble listening to a book, I promise you it just takes time. You got you to train yourself. You got to train yourself to be able to pay attention and focus that long. And also, if you are trouble, if you're having trouble focusing on an audio book or reading... It's probably your brain telling you you probably got some other shit you need to work on. That's why you need your meditative space, like we always advocate for. Get out there. Get occupied. Run, ride, walk, hike, jog, kayak, whatever. Get out there and get your shit together. Think about your stuff. And, and when you've spent an adequate amount of time, you will feel like this <sighs> calming sensation. And then you could listen to the audiobook. But if your mind starts to wander about like some stuff going on with your life, man, you, you probably should think about it. Tell them, tell them the doctor sent you. That's me. I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor now, in case you didn't know. So thanks for listening. As always, get out there and wrench your life. No one's going to wrench it for you. Why don't I give you a food rule to wrap it? We haven't done a food rule in a while. So we'll end with a Michael Pollan food rule, food rule from the book. Food Rules by Michael Palm. I think we did Rule four, 4 last time, so we're going to Rule 5. Avoid forms that have some form of sugar or sweetener listed among the top three ingredients. That's a great rule. Top three ingredients. If it's sugar or sweetener, don't freaking eat it. Right? You heard it here, boys. <laughs> Gals. People. Thank you, as always. Thanks for listening. Take it easy.